Hello and welcome to Solutions, a show about the Falmouth community and the struggles and challenges we face and some locals who are trying to solve some of those problems. Today we're talking about a global problem. I'm your host Eileen Preston and we're going to discuss ocean plastics. It's a huge problem getting bigger every day. And for a show this big, we decided, as big as the ocean, we decided to divide it into segments where we'll discuss first the science of it with the research and the scope of the situation. And then afterwards, we'll discuss the local initiative with some advocates who are really working on kind of an elegant solution to it. So first, I'm joined here today by our scientists. First, we have Erin Bryant. She's the Associate Professor of Research for Ocean Coastal Policy at Sea Education Association. And Jess Donahue, Research Assistant, assistant and Fellow Colleague at Sea Research. And you're both from Falmouth. You're both local. And Erin, I wanted to start with you first. So first of all, can you tell us a little bit about C, the research? Sure. What exactly are you doing? Yes. Uh, well, Sea Education Association is the home of Sea Semester, a college study abroad program for uh, the study of the world's oceans. Um, students come to us at, for six weeks on shore in Woods Hole and study oceanography, nautical science, um, ocean policy, uh, anthropology, history of the sea, and then they go to sea for six weeks on one of our two tall ship ocean research vessels. Um, and they receive credit for this academically rigorous program through Boston University. Um, we also have uh, ocean study programs in the summer for high school students. So our mission is to educate and inspire ocean stewards, scientists, professionals of various types. And how did you get around to plastic research? Well, uh, we didn't start out thinking about plastic. Um, we started going to sea about 46 years ago with our original um, tall ship ocean research vessel, the Westward. and. We were dragging nets through the surface waters, um, a new stun net, and students were thinking we're going to study plankton. And they started pulling up a lot of microplastics, a lot of plastic at the surface floating on the ocean. Uh, so year after year, we have repeated certain cruise tracks um, around the Pacific, North Pacific, and, and South, some of the South Pacific, as well as the North Atlantic. Now you have two research vessels, is that yes, right? Yes, yeah. yes. The core with Kramer, which which uh, I think often we have stops a, in Woods Hole. I think we have a slide right. of that. That's yes. often in Woods Hole yes. Harbor, yes. right? So the yeah. core with Kramer is uh, in the Atlantic all the time, and the Robert C. Siemens is our other vessel that's always in the Pacific Ocean. And how often does the core with Kramer go out? The core with Kramer uh, has uh, runs about ten college semester programs per year. Um, sorry, about five per year for college students and sometimes one for high school students in the summer. Um, and the same for the Robert C. Siemens. So we have 10 semester programs roughly per year. For and how big is the core with Kramer? Yeah. About 135 feet long. And the crew, how, how many people go out in the crew? About 10. 10, okay, yeah. great. Yeah. So it's three mates, a captain, uh, three assistant scientists, and a, a chief scientist oceanographer. And then a, a steward, you know, the cook, sometimes an assistant, an engineer, um, sometimes some sailing interns. Students uh, very often want to come back and sail some more after they do sea semester and I they want to come and work for us. Yeah. Yeah. So they go out into the, the core with Kramer we're going to focus on because, mm -hmm. and I think we have a slide of the plastic, mm -hmm. the voyage, where it's gone to. Okay. And so it goes into a gyre, is that right? Can you tell us about that? So there are five gyres in the world's ocean. Uh, the North Atlantic is home to one of them, right. and it's a, a circular current system. Okay. Yeah. And it, it tends to collect floating material. And why like does plastics. it collect the plastic there? Uh, because of the, the circulation of uh, Jess can perhaps yeah, explain so it it's, a little uh, better. You know, if you think of, of the, the Gulf Stream, we're all familiar with running up the east coast of the U.S., a really fast current. So if things are put into the Gulf Stream, they're not going to stay there for long. They're going to be kind of whisked out to sea. As so you have these areas of really high flow around the exterior, and then as you go into the central part of the gyre, it's an area of really low flow. So things get kind of taken away from land and put into the central part, and then there's really nowhere else for them to go. 
so they just stay there. So it sits there. So yeah, it's kind of the end of the line. So C has researched mm -hmm. this, and they had a um, they did a study, uh, one of their most recent studies, and in it they found so much plastic that they were so concerned. I just want to read what they said. Without a strategy strategy for what to do with plastic waste, humans are conducting a singular, uncontrolled experiment on a global scale in which billions of tons of material will accumulate across major terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems on the planet. So very dire, mm -hmm. right? So um, with that, I'm wondering, you've been out there, you've been at sea, you've seen it. Um, can you tell us what it looks like out there? First of all, I think there's a perception of what the garbage mm -hmm. patch looks like. If you could talk about that and then what you found out there. Yeah, definitely. So there's kind of a perception that there's, there's this big garbage patch or island of trash. So people often picture something that looks like, you know, this big island of trash that you could see from an airplane or something like that. And that's actually not what it looks like at all. When you're out there in the middle of the gyre, you just typically see sky and sea. There's occasionally an item you might recognize that floats by, but most of what you're collecting is actually microplastic. So things that are less than five millimeters in diameter, so think like smaller than a grain of rice. I think we have an image of an example of that as well. So yeah. the image shows a bunch of these microplastics on a paper towel that could fit in the palm of your hand. So you can see how tiny they actually are. And so these started out as larger items. So things that we would recognize as everyday items like bottles, um, cups, bottle caps, things like that. And then through UV degradation, they break apart into these tiny bits. And then when you're towing that noose to net at the surface, what you're collecting are these tiny bits that you can't really tell much about where they came from or what they even started out as. So, um, you, like you said, we have a slide of how very small they are. Exactly how do you go about researching it, the process? Yeah, what? so we've been using the same method since uh, we started finding plastic, as Erin mentioned. So we have a data set that starts in the mid-1980s through the present. So it's the largest data set of its kind in the world. And so what we do is we tow a Neustan net. So it's a net that's a meter wide, and we tow it right at the air-water interface. So it's only about 25 centimeters in the water and then the rest is out of the water. It has a mesh that's a third of a millimeter, so a really fine mesh, and we tow it for one, um, for about 30 minutes at two knots, so it's about one nautical mile. That's equivalent to about 2,000 bathtubs of water that we're filtering through that net every time we tow it, and we do that twice a day, every day. So those ships are out there most of the year, and at around noon and midnight every single day, the students are deploying that net, and they're bringing it back on deck, and they're you know, studying the, the zooplankton communities and the biological stuff that we're collecting, and they're also hand-picking out each individual piece of plastic. So the students are right there on the forefront collecting the data themselves and quantifying how much plastic we're getting e in each of these net toes. So all that science, and you've got to hand-pick out the plastic yeah. versus, okay, yeah. all right. So <laughs> what did you find? How much did you find, and where was the... Yeah, that's the a good thing? question. So, I mean, we're still out there collecting it, so we found... Um, you know, the large accumulation zones, as you saw on that map, where the, the dots were red and yellow and orange, that's where you're finding a lot of it. So we see that it is collecting in that gyre inside. Uh, it's about 30, lat 30 degrees north is the latitude where you kind of get this congregation of it. Um, and so we did one trip that was a plastics at sea voyage where we left from Bermuda um, and went kind of to the, to the east and just tried to study plastic. And so if you saw that map, that kind of sawtooth pattern is that trip. And one of those toes was the largest um, amount of plastic we've ever collected. So it was about 26 million pieces in a square kilometer, which was equivalent, it was like uh, 23,000 pieces or more in the actual net. So imagine picking out all of those pieces. Yeah. Um, most of the toes don't have even anywhere near that amount. You know, most of them have less than you know, 20 or so. So it's usually not taking us hours to pick out each piece, but we have found some where you're getting thousands. So what are the dangers of uh, microplastics in the ocean? Because there are a few, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah there, there are a bunch. Um, so if you think about, we'll start from the big stuff, the large debris, things like derelict fishing gear, um, packing straps, things that are bigger and kind of have a lot of pieces that things can get caught in, you have the danger of entanglement. So you might have seen images of seals or sea turtles that get caught up in things like this and then they can't, you know, if it's a, a mammal, it can't get to the surface to breathe sometimes or can get strangled. So there's that, that danger. There's also ingestion. So we know that most of the food web eats the plastics, things from a small zooplankton to seabirds, turtles, fish. 
Um, and I think I read the Ocean Conservancy said seabirds have 90% of them have plastic in their guts and sea turtles 50%. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that sounds right. That sounds and and seabirds, one thing, sometimes they can't pass the plastic through their system. So I think we have an image of a kind of a dead seabird from Midway Atoll where you see that its stomach is full of plastic. So it, it yeah. eats it. It has, you know, feels like it's full because mm -hmm. its stomach is full, but it's just full of plastic. So they're not actually getting any nutrition. Um, other organisms can pass it through their system, um, assuming they're not, you know, jagged pieces that could cause damage to their digestive tract. Um, and you also have the problem of, of rafting or of things growing on the plastic or using it as kind of a, a home or ecosystem. Right. So if we think of like the Japanese tsunami a few years ago where a large portion of man-made debris was washed into the ocean, you then have a whole bunch of things growing on it and living under potentially large items that can then make their way across the ocean. So there's been, um, I think it's over 150 recorded species that have been found on the west coast of the United States that are from the coastal waters of Japan that normally wouldn't you know, survive in open ocean environments, but they kind of make a community under these pieces of floating debris or live on the debris. So there aren't any instances of it becoming established yet, but it'll take a long time to really know if that happens. So it's kind of a potential method of invasive species as well. Yeah. And if they are sitting on a bucket, they could be eating the bucket mm -hmm. as well, right? Yeah. And plastics, um, when they, it seems like they do two strange things when they get in the water. They secrete toxins, but they also absorb toxins. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so that's kind of a, a pretty, pretty complicated subject. So there's these um, persistent organic pollutants that uh, you may have heard of, things like DDT and PAHs, things that are in our environment pretty much everywhere. And so when the plastic is out there, it kind of picks up these contaminants. A lot of them are hydrophobic, meaning they don't really like to be in the water. So if they come in contact with the plastic, they're kind of going to sorb to the surface of that plastic and stick to it. Mm -hmm. So plastics have been found to have much higher concentrations of these persistent organic pollutants than the seawater around them. However, recent studies have shown that this actually probably isn't a major source of bioaccumulation in organisms, because since these pollutants are already in the water, and you know the amount of plastic they might come in contact with with the amount of water they come in contact with even like passing over their gills and things like that that they're probably they're already at equilibrium so they're not not really most likely getting a lot of pollutants from the plastic itself but then there's a second group of pollutants that are things that are already on the plastic things that wouldn't necessarily be in the ocean if it wasn't for the plastic things like um, plasticizers additives like bpa things things things, things like that that are going into the ocean on the plastic. And so then those potentially could be, you know, a source of, of contaminants there. So there's, I mean, it's a very difficult web to untangle and there's a lot of researchers that are working on individual contaminants and organisms and trying to, to get some better answers for us there. So what, we know how much we should worry. We have a few areas to worry. What don't we know so far? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot that we don't know. Um, if we talk about the amount of plastic that's out there, there's a few different ways that we've kind of estimated that. So there was a recent study that looked at inputs of plastic to the ocean from land. And so they estimated that in one year, it was 2010, all of the 192 countries that have a coastline, the input was about 8 million metric tons in one year that goes into the ocean. So that's equivalent to if you take like a grocery bag full of recyclables and you stack up five of those on every foot of every coastline on the entire planet. That's the equivalent plastic that's going in in one year. And we also have estimates based on our data and other groups that have done studies at sea where they're looking at how much plastic we're actually collecting at the surface. And I think that number is about 90,000 to 230,000 metric tons that we've you know, estimated to be out there with computer models and, and collected data. And so those numbers don't match up at all, you know, 100,000 to 8 million metric tons. So it's only about 1% of the plastic that we think is going in in a year or we're actually So you're not actually out there. finding yeah, so the amount that big, you anticipate mm -hmm. to be in there. Exactly. So there's kind of this big missing plastic chunk. So there's a lot that we don't understand about, you know, what's actually happening to the plastic when it gets in the ocean. How long does it take for that cup to turn into a handful of microplastics and then what happens next? Um, we don't really know where it's all being stored. So is there, there's not big quantitative studies of the seafloor yet, so we don't really know how much plastic is on the seafloor. Um, we know that at about half of the plastic polymers float and half of them sink, so we don't have good data of what, what's actually on the bottom of the ocean. Um, we're studying the very surface of the water, and sometimes there's been some groups that have studied down to about 10, 20 meters. 
But then the rest of that water column all the way down to the bottom is not studied, so we don't know what is in, in that region. Um, there's a lot we don't know about how much is actually in the organisms that are eating it. Right. Um, and if we are eating it. And, yeah, yeah, and we mm -hmm. don't know, you know, how much is washing up on beaches of, of remote places, things like that. So there's a lot of basically missing plastic. This, this research is very much in the beginning stages at yeah. this point, so there's still some basic questions we don't have answered yet. Now, I see on social media sometimes some ideas about how to clean it up, and mm -hmm. I wonder what you think about some of those, uh, some vacuums or putting booms around and mm -hmm. sucking it all in. What do you think of those yeah, ideas. so, you know, when you think of the misconception of the, the garbage patch, if it were actually this island, it would be quite easy to go out and just scoop it up, right? But because it's all of these tiny pieces of plastic and it's more like a plastic soup with all of the zooplankton and that base of the food web out there, that becomes really difficult to pick up. So if, if it were even feasible to go out and cover the whole of the five gyres, which it's not, um, you'd be doing more harm than good by scooping all of it out because you'd be also taking out all of those biological critters that are important to our food web. Um, so that becomes really challenging. And also if you don't stop it at the source, it's never, you know, even if we could go out and clean it all up today, if we don't, you know, turn off that source, it's never going to really solve the problem. So we really need to work on prevention and th doing things like beach cleanups and picking it up before it gets in the water is easier than picking it up when it's tiny little bits out in the middle of the ocean. So I think we need to do a lot more with um, using less and cleaning up what's out there and managing our waste properly. Yeah, those plastic water bottles, right? They're missing, right? So what do you suggest? Well, we have um, some partners that we're enjoying working with. Uh, we have funding from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA's Marine Debris Program. The federal government is concerned about um, plastics at sea and, and the impacts that humans are having in that area. So um, there was an executive order a couple of years ago that said the federal agencies need to be using behavioral science to better serve the American public. Um, so NOAA's Marine Debris Program is interested in us looking at how, how does social norms theory and how do other behavioral aspect, behavioral science um, theories, uh, how can they help us uh, change behavior? So that's so exactly how, what we're going to be yeah. talking about in yes. our next segment, yeah. which is about an initiative to change behavior, right? right. right. Ladies, I thank you very much for your expertise Thanks on this subject. We really appreciate it. It's a lot of work. It's a big problem, and I'm glad you're working on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello and welcome back to Solutions. This is our second segment on plastics in the ocean. And I'm going to talk today with Meredith Kincaid and Sadie Levesque. They're advocates for Skip the Straw campaign. Ladies, thank you very much for being here. You're going to talk to us about an initiative you have to help with the ocean plastic problem. So Skip the Straw, Meredith Kincaid, can I start with you? Sure. What's that? What's the Skip the Straw campaign? It's um, a big group of a big age range of us um, who are trying to educate people about plastics in general and how they like do. We're, we're telling people, educating them on how plastics they get in the ocean and they're bad for the world and we're educating people on how they can cut down on their plastic use in an easy way. How many of you are there? in the Skip the Straw movement? Um, there were five founding members when we started in 2015, and, and it's just been growing ever since. We have yeah. many, many members. Oh, great, great. Mm -hmm. And were you both the founding members? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've been doing this for how long? Uh, three plus years. Three plus yes, years. Three years yeah. So exactly what is Skip the Straw? What does Skip the Straw mean? Um, it means that since straws are generally unnecessary, you don't really need them. People oh. are just used to using them. That's true. Um, you can cut down on your use of straws super easily because they're not something necessary or somewhat necessary like a plastic spoon or a plastic fork if you're having a picnic or whatever. And a but bunch of people don't recognize how like 
they don't really need them throughout their daily lives. It's How just, unnecessary they yeah. are, yeah. It's just a habit. Mm -hmm. We just take yeah. them because they're given to us in the mm -hmm. kings, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you go around to restaurants, is that where you go? Yes, mm -hmm. we go to restaurants and... Um, Especially we, in the Falmouth area. Mm -hmm. And Woods Hole. And we have talked at public events, science stroll, estuaries day. And food markets and schools and stuff like that, yeah. And how many restaurants have you got to sign on? I'd like to hear your pitch of what you say to the manager when you come. Well, we've talked to quite a few, and we're going to follow up with a lot of them in Woods Hole when summer comes back around, because right. that's when they're busiest. And um, we basically try not to be pushy and say you're doing something wrong. Yeah. We just say that we are interested in helping them and help the environment. Some of them aren't very open to a new idea. They're not. Yeah, but and some are. Yeah, others are very open, I guess. Mm -hmm. So would you say it's half and half, or how many would you say? Yeah, I think most of the people are accepting the idea that they need um, a better way of managing their plastics and helping the environment, but there are some people who don't want to have anything to do with it, I guess. Yeah. People, they don't really mind much. People get defensive because they feel like you're blaming me because I'm doing something wrong. For their business, yeah, mm -hmm. they're yeah. trying to work a business. Yeah. But we try to tell them that they're doing nothing wrong, it's just that they can do things better and yeah. they can help the environment in an easy way by giving straws only upon request or not at all. Yeah, it's a wonderful idea. Falmouth has 68 miles of coastline, so mm -hmm. we have the longest coastline of any town in Cape Cod. Yeah. So we really do have to take care of it. And you were kind enough to give me a, uh, a handout on what is found in, on beaches. Yes. And straws, I guess, is number seven on the list. Yeah. yeah, straws are found everywhere on all the beaches around the world, and they're completely unnecessary. Everyone's just so accustomed to using them. Yeah. And yeah. It will, you have to break your habits, but after that, it's really not that hard to. So are you asking people to say something to their to their server, like please don't give me a straw? Yeah. So normally what we say is tell them you would not like a straw and sort of tell them why. Some waiters don't really mind that much, some do it anyway, but most mm -hmm. listen, I guess. And I noticed that the number one thing found on beaches is cigarette butts. So I guess mm -hmm. I didn't realize they have plastic in them, right? Yeah. yeah, the filters are plastic. We have a slide for what, you, what you've what you shown us. So there's mm -hmm. cigarette butts. Number two is plastic beverage bottles on the yeah. beach. That makes sense. And then it's bottle caps, food wrappers, plastic grocery bags, mm -hmm. which we're trying yeah. to cut down on in Falmouth, mm -hmm. plastic lids, straws and stirrers. Uh, glass beverage bottles, other plastic bags, and then foam takeaway containers. Yeah, yes. those are big ones oh, too. Those are awful because they're made of oil, you know. And oh, yeah. uh, straws are actually a petroleum-based plastic as well. Um, okay. So they are made from oil drawn from the ground, which is not that good, and they never go away. They'll keep breaking down into smaller, smaller pieces if they're in the ocean. They're being whacked around by the waves, knocked around, yeah. but they're never going to go away. They're just going to be smaller and smaller. And most of the plastic in the ocean is microplastics that you can barely see or not even see with the naked eye. Right. But they're the ones that are causing the most problems. Seabirds are swallowing them and just getting sick because and they have oil in their stomach, you know. Yeah, Some plastics yeah. say, like, biodegradable. They can be broken down, but that's mostly in a high heat facility that most people don't really have access oh, to. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. I didn't and realize so, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. when they get in the ocean, that doesn't do anything. It, they just mm -hmm. keep breaking down into little pieces. They never go away. The same as the other ones. Straws that say they're compostable are yes. most likely compostable, but only in a high heat facility. And many cities and towns do not have access to one of those. So most compostable straws and other plastic objects just end up in the ocean like the others and they don't dissolve or anything. They yeah. just are yeah. the same as all the other plastic. And then I, I believe it's the plastic water bottles that are most found on the beach. That's yeah. that's one of the big ones. That was they're not finding those in the ocean because they think they're so dense they're just sinking down to the bottom and yes. maybe they can't find them since yeah. those nets go so and they're really unnecessary too. I mean you it's easy to stop by whatever gas station and buy a plastic water bottle, but it's 
probably cheaper in the long run and so much better for the environment to just buy a reusable water bottle yeah, and use steel that stainless like that. steel and it's better for you you're not you know consuming bpas and whatever now besides the skip the straw is there other things you're doing to get rid of plastic in the ocean are there other initiatives that you have we um, have an initiative that's sort of between sea i think and mm -hmm. um skip the straw it's yeah. called trash and splash uh -huh. and um, we're sort of working on all plastics. I mean, Skip the Straw is too, but Trash Shouldn't Splash is more encompassing all single-use plastics and trying to cut down on those. And are you doing beach cleanups? Yes, we are yeah, doing lots of beach cleanups. Because cleanups. Yeah. the more we study this problem, it seems like we have to start at the beaches, not cleaning up mm -hmm. the ocean. Mm -hmm. That seems like it yeah. might not be possible, but mm -hmm. the beach, right? It's where it all washes up. Yeah, so. it's good to clean up the ocean, but a good place that everyone can access is the beach. Just put on a pair of rubber gloves, go clean up the beach. It's covered in gross stuff and we don't want that to get in the ocean we don't want that on our beaches right you also gave me a slide of uh, weird things that are found on the beach right oh, and one yeah. of the one of the weird things was pianos uh, microwave ovens don't know why anyone would bring that to the beach it's, it's but, random There's yeah they, different toilets to the sea wash up people just leave them yeah it's like they think that they're dumping it they're, they're yeah. dumping yeah. it. They think the sea's a landfill. It's really not. I mean, there's so much life in the sea. Yeah. And so, people think so much. And they think that they're putting in the ocean will be gone forever. No one will mind. But it's affecting the world underwater. I mean, terribly and hugely. Yes. And we don't know how far down the plastic goes. And yeah, yeah we have no idea. If it's out of visual range, if people can't see it, they sort of put it to their back of their mind and they don't really notice it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what motivates you girls particularly? Is it you don't want plastic inside the fish you eat? Is it dirty beaches? What is it exactly that motivates you? I think it's mostly just the idea of how real it is, how big it is. Some mm -hmm. places the air is so polluted that it's hard to breathe and mm -hmm. it's just the awful effects that it has on the earth. It's plastic is terrible for the earth. You don't want it on your beach. You don't want it in your ocean ruining the whole ocean's ecosystem. You, you don't want plastic anywhere, really, and it's a real problem, and it's affecting people now. It's right. not gonna be a problem, in the or it will be a problem in the future, but it's a problem right now, and it's just good to have people stop using plastics as soon as they can, because it can only go yeah. downhill yeah. if we keep going at this rate. Your rarity. last beach cleanup was? On Trunk River, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how much trash did you pick up? In how many hours? Um, um, was it two hours and 60 pounds? Does I that think sound it was right? Around 66 pounds of trash. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. It was crazy. There were so crazy, many things. Yes. That we so didn't we're pick up. glad that you're on this, girls. We mm -hmm. really, really. Uh, how can anyone help if they want to join you? Well, um, do you have a website? We or? do have yeah. a website, and people can pledge to not use plastic straws as much and when they're out to eat just um, tell just the waiter ask and the wait staff not to give you a straw and say because they get into the ocean and also just in your everyday life just cut down on all single-use plastic straws are a gateway plastic and, and especially for everyone on cape cod everyone near a beach um especially walking around on beaches. Whether it's in the summer or winter, you can still pick up some trash if you see it. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna do all of that. I'm gonna <laughs> really try. Thank you so much. We thank really you. appreciate your passion. And thank you all for watching Solutions and let's keep looking for solutions in the community. Thank you.